Last year, I uploaded a video entitled, 11 of the worst YouTubers. Despite what the title might imply, neither that video nor this one covers YouTubers who make crappy or subpar content. If that were the case, what culture gaming would be near the top, since I honestly can't stand how obnoxious, woke and British they are. And I'm British too, so I can complain about them being too British. No. The YouTubers I'll be talking about in this video are actual criminals who have committed acts that range from being caught with some compromising images on their hard drive to straight up murder. Here are 10 more of the worst YouTubers. Thaddeus McMichael, more well known by his YouTube handle, MadThad0890, was a user well known for being very open about his status as a weeaboo, regularly talking about it on social media. He was also infamous for his strange behavior regarding a character from the anime school days named Kotonoha Katsura, who he viewed as his waifu, and even made a separate Facebook account for her, where he would post comments as Kotonoha expressing her love for him. It also got a little weirder than that, with him marking Kotonoha's birthday by making her a cake Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday Kotonoha, happy birthday to you. Blow out the candles Kotonoha. Yay! I love you. And I hope you have a good birthday today. Now time for a delicious cake with my waifu. Yay! You jelly? And on a more gross level, writing fanfiction in which he engages in sexual acts with her. This is certainly odd behavior, but at the very least, his hobby wasn't hurting anyone. Unfortunately, Thaddeus had a much more disturbing and highly illegal hobby that would eventually come to light. From what I've been able to find, the first indication of what kind of man Thaddeus was came in a post he made complaining about Chris Hansen and his TV series, To Catch a Predator. In the post, he called Chris a cock blocker for tricking these men into believing that they were meeting with a minor, when in reality, they were there to be caught on camera. As you can see, he wasn't happy about Chris stopping these men from preying on minors. He made several other posts on his Facebook account saying that CP isn't wrong because, quote, sometimes they want it, and various other disgusting statements. This caught the eye of one of his Facebook friends, and they reported Thaddeus to the police. It didn't take long for Thaddeus to be investigated by the FBI, at which point he claimed that the Facebook posts that he'd been reported for were just jokes. The FBI did not believe him, and later found between 300 to 350 CP images and videos on his hard drive leading to his arrest in March 2012. He was released after posting bail, with the condition that he must wear an ankle monitor and not use the internet until his bail was up. Only three days later, he posted this tweet. I'm back, missing my waifu. Stupid feds didn't even find my backup hard drive. Needless to say, he was arrested again following this, and since he outright admitted that he had a backup hard drive, there was no chance of him avoiding jail time. He entered into a plea bargain where he would serve 5 to 25 years in prison. He was sent to prison on July 18th, 2013, and was released exactly 5 years later on July 18th, 2018. It would seem he was prohibited from uploading to his YouTube channel for quite some time after his release, as he didn't begin uploading again until 2021. The only people really watching his videos appeared to be trolls leaving comments calling him a legend, obviously a joke, but Thaddeus seems to think they're being honest. I suppose one could say Thaddeus isn't really a danger to anyone now, as his activity online is almost certainly always being monitored by the authorities. But there's no denying that, as a convicted sex offender, he's certainly a questionable YouTuber, and here's hoping he's never allowed near children ever again. Amos Yi Ping Sang is a former actor, blogger, and YouTuber from Singapore. At the age of only 13 years old, he won Best Actor and Best Film Award for a film he made called Chan. So why did you ask us to get her here? Yeah, I was busy playing Halo Reach. What's up? Boys, we got something bad going on. Please elaborate. 
bit further. Jen, my best friend, she has cancer. Cancer? Seriously? Cancer? Yes, it seems like she has eaten too much McDonald's, and every time she puts like five packets of salt onto her fries, and she always buys a double McSpicy with extra soya sauce. It seems that now she has stomach cancer, and a huge stomach ulcer is invading her small intestine. The attention he received from the film led to him being cast by Jack Neo in his film We Not Naughty, in which Amos played a character named Amos. Despite only having a minor role in the film, Jack Neo praised Amos as a natural comedian and even allowed him to write his own dialogue for the movie. In January 2012, Amos attracted his first controversy when he uploaded a video to YouTube mocking Chinese New Year, calling it a rip-off of the Western New Year. Hello! In my country, Singapore, we celebrate Chinese New Year on February, which I don't get. We already have a new year, so why do we have Chinese New Year? It's like somebody from China said, Hey, America has a new year and we don't have one. Oh, let's quickly copy that idea and then make it a festive season for us. He later defended himself, saying the video was just satire. In March 2015, Amos attracted more controversy when he uploaded a video criticizing the recently deceased Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew. Lee Kuan Yew? contrary to popular belief, was a horrible person and an awful leader to our country. He was a dictator, but managed to fool most of the world to think he was democratic, and he did so by still granting us the opportunity to vote to make it seem like we have freedom of choice. However, during your rule, you control the entire media and education, proliferating nationalistic propaganda on a daily basis. Now, seeing what Lee Kuan Yew has done, I'm sure many individuals who have done similar things comes to mind, but I'm going to compare him to someone that people haven't really mentioned before. Jesus. And the aptness of that analogy is heightened, seeing how Christian seems to be a really big fan of him. They are both power-hungry and malicious, but deceive others into thinking that they are compassionate and kind. Their impact and legacy will ultimately not last, as more and more people find out that they're full of bull. And Lee Kuan Yew's followers are completely delusional and ignorant, and have absolutely no sound logic or knowledge about him that is grounded in reality which Lee Kuan Yew very easily manipulates, similar to the Christian knowledge of the Bible and the work of a multitude of priests. Amos was actually arrested for this and would be charged with the intention of wounding the religious feelings of Christians, obscenity, and threatening abusive or insulting communication, and would receive a four-week jail sentence. He was jailed again a year later after he was arrested for making blog posts criticizing Islam. He served six weeks in prison for this. While there, he was visited by Melissa Chen, a US-based Singaporean activist who gave him documents that would allow him to leave Singapore and move to the United States. When he moved to the US, he was granted asylum after it was ruled that he would face persecution if he returned to Singapore. Amos said that being granted asylum in the US meant he would be able to criticize the Singaporean government without fear of consequences and planned to upload many videos to his YouTube channel on the subject knowing the Singaporean government couldn't stop him. It wouldn't take long for Amos to attract controversy of a much different kind though. In November 2017, he uploaded three videos in which he expressed support for pedophilia. Unfortunately for Amos, his activity on YouTube did not go unnoticed by the American public. Harvard University cancelled a talk that Amos was supposed to give. He also found himself uninvited from other events he was due to speak at, and as such, was not getting paid. This resulted in him attempting to get his Facebook followers to donate to him, as he said he did not want to get a job. Over the next year, Amos Yee would continue to face controversy due to his quite frankly disturbing content, with his channel being completely demonetized in 2018, after the Toy Industry Association complained that their advertisements, obviously aimed at children, had been appearing on his videos. A month later, his YouTube channel was terminated for violating the site's terms of service. Patreon followed suit two months later and banned him from their site as well. In December of that same year, his Facebook, Twitter and WordPress accounts were also shut down. By this point, 
It was clear that the internet was basically trying to get rid of him, since no social media site wanted someone like him operating on them. Despite all of this, after a nine-month hiatus in 2019, he stated in September of that year that he was planning on making a comeback, with even more pro-pedophilia videos already recorded. At this point, it seemed that Amos Yi almost relished in his newfound infamy, and could easily have been seen as a troll who just wanted to get a rise out of people with his outrageous views. However, in 2020, it would be revealed that Amos had been engaging in the very acts he had been showing support for. In October 2020, it was reported that he had been arrested on charges of soliciting CP from a 14-year-old girl. The thousands of messages between the two revealed that the girl had told Amos many times that she was underage. She had contacted a group that hunted pedophiles, which led to his arrest soon after. He originally pleaded not guilty to the charges, but later changed his plea to guilty in 2021, after accepting a plea deal that would see him sentenced to six years in prison, though he'll apparently be eligible for parole in 2023. There's a good chance that he'll be deported to Singapore upon his release. While many people there showed support for him during his time in jail when he was a teenager, it seems highly unlikely that his imprisonment will be protested if the Singaporean government decides to jail him once again. Due to his disgusting actions, it's fairly safe to say that nobody will be coming to Amos Yee's rescue this time, and that he's looking at a long time behind bars if the US government makes the decision to deport him. It turns out Austin Jones was not the first musical YouTuber to use his fame to take advantage of his young female fanbase. Mike Lombardo was an American musician and YouTuber who made his name on the site uploading piano-based rock songs that he'd written himself. He'd also occasionally post tutorials, personal updates, and even music videos. Having gained a name for himself in the fairly early days of YouTube, he caught the attention of DTBA Records, and through them, he released his first studio album, Songs for a New Day in 2010. He would continue recording over the next year, including a live album he recorded at a coffee shop in Philadelphia. As you can probably guess, Mike was not as big of a star as Austin Jones, and he never toured extensively, rarely played to large crowds, and also didn't get invited to Warp Tour like Austin. His channel also wasn't what you'd call big at 20,000 subscribers. While that's certainly not a small number, he wasn't a big name on YouTube as a whole, Nevertheless, he still had a dedicated fan base, mostly made up of teenage girls. And it's obviously here that we come to his downfall. In December 2011, the FBI raided Mike's home after they had received word from a University of Boston student that Mike, who at that point was 23 years old, had arranged a New Year's Eve meeting with a 15-year-old girl who was planning to travel from her Indiana home to meet him. When the FBI interviewed the girl in question, she told them that she and Mike had exchanged photos with each other, and upon searching her phone, they found numerous nude photos of him. Other teenage girls came forward with information on their interactions with Mike, with one of them saying he had performed an obscene act of a webcam and tried to get her to do the same. FBI agents seized four computers, Mike's cell phone, a Motorola tablet, and a variety of hard drives and other storage devices from his home. He was held in police custody for five days before being released. In July 2012, the authorities would return, and Mike was arrested on 11 charges of soliciting CP. Mike's defense was saying that his victims happily obliged when he asked them for images, as if that made things better. He also claimed that the reason he did what he did is because he had no friends and so depended on online friendships. An online conversation between Mike and a 16-year-old girl from 2010 showed him telling her to delete the chat logs, saying, quote, that's like five years in federal prison and sex offender registration, showing he was fully aware that he was breaking the law. Prosecution was pushing for him to spend a maximum of 20 years behind bars. This was reduced to five years after a plea bargain with the FBI that stated he had to hand over all of his computers as well as his phone. Mike began his sentence in 2014 and was released four years later in 2018. Since his release, Mike Lombardo has disappeared from the spotlight, having no online presence at all, presumably because his parole probably prohibits him from owning a computer. The majority of his fans will have most likely moved on and forgotten about him now. These days, Mike Lombardo is a relic of YouTube's past, and considering what he did, it's best that he stays there.
David Rock was a Canadian YouTuber who operated under the name David's Farm. As the name of the channel suggests, he would film videos showing his daily life working on his London, Ontario farm. He would also post more outlandish stunt style videos from time to time, which definitely helped him gain attention in the early days of YouTube, to the point where he was actually one of the most popular YouTubers in Canada at the time. This was especially impressive when you remember that he was much older than the big stars of the time, such as Shane Dawson, Smosh and Fred. So a YouTuber who appeared to be in his late 40s, gaining a following on a site that was, and more or less still is, dominated by teens and people in their early 20s, was certainly unexpected. His channel grew fast and became highly profitable for him. At one point, he apparently was making anywhere from $11,000 to $16,000 a month from his videos. Of course, like all famous YouTubers, viewers became curious as to what David had been doing prior to his fame on the internet, and naturally began searching for information. Unfortunately, what they found in 2010 would be far more disturbing than what they had been expecting. In 1991, David was arrested for producing CP and also for having harmed at least one child. In total, David pleaded guilty to seven charges and spent one year in prison. Upon the information of David's past being made public, many of his subscribers were naturally disgusted to learn that the man who they'd been watching and supporting was, in fact, a convicted sex offender. David attempted to defend his actions, saying that he was suffering from manic depression at the time of the crimes and that he had served his time and paid his debt to society. Several months later, YouTube would terminate his channel for violating community guidelines, though he made another channel only days later, and this channel quickly grew. Shockingly, this would not be the peak of David's infamy on the internet, as two years later, he would once again find himself in the news. In 2012, David was once again arrested for possessing CP, though he claimed that these were just nudist videos and that there was no sexual content in the videos at all. In a 16 by 9 documentary made earlier that year, David claimed he was not a predator and instead referred to himself as a quote, voyeur, and added that he had enough money to pay his victims to shut up if he was really a predator. Are you a sexual predator? I absolutely say no. Don't call me a pedophile, don't call me all those things. Call me a voyeur, that was what was wrong with me. I've been clean for 20 years. I wasn't doing this stuff all along. I hang out with women. I mean, this is why I have children. I, I like, it's women I'm after, not children. I have lots of money. If I wanted to exploit children, I could certainly pay them and pay them to shut up or pay them to do whatever I wanted. Not long after his arrest, his second channel was terminated for a copyright violation. I couldn't find any information on whether or not David went to prison in 2012, or for how long, but this would not be his final run-in with the law. In 2016, David was arrested after the authorities once again found inappropriate pictures of children on his property, this time being hidden under the rug in his barn. Having seemingly run out of excuses, David showed no remorse for his actions and pleaded guilty to the charges, which saw him sentenced to nine months in prison. You'd think this would spell the end of David's time on the internet, but as of this video, he has once again returned to YouTube, although his views are nowhere near what they once were, implying that the vast majority of his old fans have either forgotten about him or don't want to support him. I personally am shocked that he's even on YouTube at all at this point. Many will say that he doesn't deserve his criticism because he's, quote, served his time. The problem with that is he's served his time at least twice for the same very serious offense. Not to mention he's shown zero remorse for what he's done. I can't imagine he'll ever reach the same heights he did well over a decade ago, and that he'll eventually fade into obscurity and just be another memory on this website. Which, honestly, is what he deserves at this point. Leighton the Fute is a YouTuber based out of Kelowna, Canada. He originally started out being much more active on Instagram, where he gained some attention for his bizarre images of clay sculptures that he had created. These images were almost all obscene in nature, and it seemed that he was an artist who specialized on creating works with the intention to shock those who view them. Some shock artists do go too far, such as when YouTuber Mark McGowan conducted a piece of performance art in 2007 that he called eating the queen's dog, in which he publicly consumed the meat of a corgi dog as a form of protest of a fox hunt 
led by Prince Philip. While Leighton's art was not that extreme, it did cause many people to wonder if there was something wrong with him. His YouTube channel was much tamer to begin with, as he would mostly just upload inoffensive claymation videos. While they weren't necessarily disturbing, they were quite violent, usually containing gratuitous amounts of clay gore. The blood obviously wasn't real, and these characters featured in these videos were literally just clay, so there probably wasn't anything that set off alarm bells for anyone watching. There's plenty of artists and animators who use blood and gore in their videos for dramatic effect, so Leighton's videos were nothing that most people hadn't seen before. The claymation videos did become much more violent and obscene as the years went on though, with Leighton making the kind of videos you'd see on gore sites, but again, this was with clay, so no one was actually getting hurt. Taking all of this into account, it was easy for most people to just dismiss Leighton as an edgelord who only made videos like this in hopes it would get a reaction out of people. He was also known to have a deviant art account, where he'd post more of the same edgy images, including one of a character he made called Itchy the Maniac, a character inspired by John Wayne Gacy's Pogo the Clown persona. Again, it's easy to just write this off as Leighton being the edgy teenager who probably walked around high school wearing a trench coat, saying how great Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold were. He took a break from producing any content for two years in 2017 and returned in 2019, announcing that he planned to upload a video of himself dancing while wearing clay breasts. By the way, he actually did upload this video and I'm not showing it because I have a bad feeling it will get this video demonetized and plus nobody wants to see this guy with his shirt off. From this point, he just continued posting more of his odd artwork, albeit now of a more sexual than violent nature. It really did seem like he was going out of his way to make everyone see him as a weirdo and it was getting harder to tell whether or not he was playing a character or if this was really who he was. In 2019, we would come to learn that he was, indeed, a truly sick individual. He began uploading clay model images of himself abusing animals. He hadn't gone this far before, so it was at this point that people finally began to become concerned about his behaviour. And it was this tweet that foreshadowed just how bad he would become. He purchased three pet hamsters and posted a video of himself playing with them on his bed. The video itself isn't disturbing, but the description absolutely is. It read, pin stabbed, drowned, microwaved. The next day, he uploaded a video in which he brutally tortured and killed three hamsters. The video was of course removed from YouTube for violating community guidelines. I have no idea if this video is still on the internet somewhere and I have absolutely no intention of trying to find it. Needless to say, those who saw the video were horrified and outraged and called for him to be reported to his local authorities, but due to his channel being so small, there wasn't enough of an uproar to really catch the attention of the police. Leighton was actually disappointed by this, as he clearly wanted people to be outraged by his actions and to be an infamous figure on the internet. This led to him re-uploading the video onto Reddit multiple times a year later in 2020. A week later, he was finally arrested and charged with three counts of animal cruelty. He was bailed only three days later, which many people were outraged by and led to them protesting outside the courthouse, clearly believing he should be jailed. I really kind of hope that, you know, and the lawyers, the judges that are walking in can see that, you know, this is something that matters, you know, this is a horrific acts that he allegedly caused. But, uh, you know, with the video proof and with his uh, the, the gr gruesome, gruesome Instagram and media accounts that depict hundreds of images of claymation of rape, torture, murder, you know, uh, his kill kits online, and with claymation with him and a cat and a knife, you know, it's it's one of those things that this is how you... People that start with animals don't usually stop there. Obviously, I can't say that would happen for sure, but he obviously needs some psychiatric help. And, uh, you know, the justice needs to step up because, you know, the lives of animals matter too. And keeping our community safe should be our priority. His trial eventually went ahead in August 2021, where he was given an 18-month conditional sentence, which stated that he was banned from entering pet shops, was prohibited from using any form of social media, and must attend therapy. As of this video, his sentence is still in effect, meaning he hasn't been active on the internet at all in nearly a year, and YouTube has terminated his channel for violating the community guidelines. This is actually why I wasn't able to use much footage of his videos. That's probably for the best though, since I honestly think this sick bastard deserves to be forgotten, since quite literally everything he ever did online was to get attention through any means necessary. He didn't care what he had to do as long as people noticed him. Well, it worked for a while when this sad, pathetic little man killed three defenseless hamsters, but I'm sure he realizes he can't pull anything like that again since the authorities are now aware of him and will arrest him in a heartbeat if he harms any more animals on camera. 
I doubt he wants to go to jail because, well, just look at him. They'd eat him alive. Leighton, if you're watching this, do everyone a favor and stay off the internet forever and get rid of that goofy ass haircut, you cringy edgelord loser. Joshua Huffman is a YouTuber and furry who began uploading in 2012. He apparently got into the furry fandom after being introduced to it by his friend, Levi Dane Simmons, aka Snake Thing, who as it turns out is actually an absolutely awful human being as well. He isn't a YouTuber, hence why he doesn't have his own entry on here, but he's probably the worst person I've mentioned so far, as he's actually serving 25 years in prison right now, for doing some disgusting acts with both animals and children. The fact that Joshua would associate with someone like him should serve as a bit of foreshadowing to what he himself is actually like. For the first few years on his time on YouTube as Kiro the Wolf, Joshua was only really well known in the furry community until 2017, when Shane Dawson was approached by his friend Ashley Fox to make a video on the furry community, and the furry who would be showcased in this video was Kiro the Wolf. Okay, here is my plan. I want to talk to Kiro because I have a lot of questions, but also I'm just genuinely interested in this whole world. And I know a lot of you guys are probably judging this. I mean, it is weird, but I feel like maybe once we know more about it, then maybe we'll understand it more. Shane even interviewed Joshua in the video. And one of the questions he asked was whether there was a sexual side of being a furry. Joshua confirmed that there is, but denied that he himself found any sexual gratification from being a furry. You know, there's a big myth or um, stereotype, I guess, of furries, which is that it's a solely sexual thing. And a it's, lot of you guys say it's not, right? It's not. Honestly, the age variation in furries, it can go anywhere from a person to be 12 years old to like 60 years old. There's a huge range of ages in here so most of the furry phantom is not a fetish there is a sexual side to it but it's not that large right most of us do it for like a hobby or a lifestyle needless to say joshua appearing on shane's channel led to a huge amount of exposure for him with his channel going from 10,000 subscribers to 90,000 within a month and over a hundred thousand by the start of 2018 people praised joshua for shining a positive light on the furry community with his kind words and upbeat personality. Unfortunately, it would later be revealed that Joshua was a fraud and certainly not the good person he made himself out to be. In September 2018, chat logs began making the rounds on Twitter, exposing a Zudinist, necrophiliac, and also pedophilic group of furries who were operating on the encrypted messenger app, Telegram. One of the furries exposed in these chat logs was none other than Kiro the Wolf. Many of these screenshots show him chatting with Snake Thing, talking about engaging in obscene acts with dead animals. Joshua seemed to enjoy talking about engaging in disgusting acts with roadkill, talking about cub porn, and most disturbing of all, sharing videos of animal snuff films. Naturally, Joshua denied that it was really him in these screenshots, and claimed he was hacked and showed a screenshot that apparently showed that his telegram had been accessed by someone in Iran. However, people quickly figured out that he was lying, as the Kiro the Wolf account seen in the telegram chat logs displayed far too many similarities to the Kiro being accused for it to be a coincidence. They displayed the same fetishes, lived in the same state, and bragged about how Shane Dawson's video had helped his channel grow. Perhaps the most damning piece of evidence shows him talking about a video he'd just made at the time but hadn't uploaded yet, and shared a picture of the thumbnail. This would have to be a very good hacker for them to be able to have access to Joshua's PC so that they could take a picture of the screen. There's also the stuff about his dog who passed away in 2017, where he talks about it being in poor health at the time and how he felt guilt over what he had done to the dog. Snake Thing, being the paragon of virtue that he is, reassured him that the dog forgave him and probably enjoyed everything he and Joshua did together. Seriously, fuck this guy. Around this time, Shane Dawson privated the video he had done with Joshua, and it was more or less universally accepted that Joshua was guilty of the actions he was accused of. Things got even worse for Joshua when an account was discovered on beastforum.com that shares his birthday, was based out of Pennsylvania, and also posted pictures of the same dog that Kiro was talking about in the Telegram leaks, where he was discussing what he wanted to do to it. One of the pictures of the dog was also posted to Joshua's Fur Affinity account. He deleted the photos from this account, but by this point, he had already been caught out. With this, 
Joshua had no way of denying the allegations against him anymore. His associates that were actually exposed with him in these leaks were actually even worse than him. There's the aforementioned snake thing, who of course is in prison where he belongs now. But there was also Woof, a Cuban zoophile who pleaded with Kiwi Farms not to dox him after they found out who he was. But once the farms discovers who a criminal is, they will dox them. Which is exactly what they did to Woof, leading to thousands of people in Cuba calling for his imprisonment. Though as far as we know, he's still free today. But considering how many people know exactly who he is and where he lives, they're most likely keeping a close eye on him. By far the worst person exposed in these leaks was Tim Wynn, a 61 year old man who has been making animal snuff films for over 30 years, taking an immense amount of joy in what he does. These are the people Joshua enjoyed hanging out with, these were his friends. I wish I could finish this segment and say that Joshua was reported to the police and was sent to prison where he still remains to this day. Unfortunately, that's not the case. While all the evidence was sent to the authorities, including a video from 2014 where Joshua filmed himself abusing his dog, the statute of limitations of bestiality in the state of New York, where he is currently living, is two years, and by the time the evidence was given to the authorities, it had already been four years since Joshua committed the acts he was exposed for. As of today, Joshua has returned to YouTube and is semi-active though his channel doesn't get anywhere near the views he was once getting in his prime. And he seems to remove all comments criticizing him, since all of the comments on his videos are positive, including this lengthy comment made by a channel called Protector of Furries, Shiro, who is most likely just Joshua on an alt account. It really is infuriating that Joshua and almost all of his accomplices have seemingly escaped any consequences for their disgusting actions the Snape thing being the only exception. For all we know, Joshua, Woof and Tim Wynn are still out there, abusing animals for their own sick pleasures. I just can't wrap my head around how zoo files can take a look at something like a puppy and want to do such horrible things to it. Dogs are called man's best friend for a reason. They're loyal animals who just want to make their owners happy and to be looked after in return. Dogs should be seen as friends and even members of the family not objects to be used for some sick freak's depraved fantasies. The bottom line is, zoo files should absolutely not be allowed on YouTube promoting their disgusting interests. If they've acted on their urges, they should be in prison, and if they haven't acted on them, they need some serious mental help. In Kiro the Wolf's case, he should absolutely be in prison right now. Some insane people still support him, but everyone else now knows him for what he is, a cruel and depraved monster. I'm sure Chris Chan doesn't need much of an introduction, since they are probably the most infamous figure on the internet. Christian Weston Chandler is a 40-year-old former YouTuber and artist. He first gained the internet's attention in 2007, when this picture of him was posted to 4chan, showing him in one of his many colourful shirts, his thick glasses, and of course, his Sonichu medallion. He'd actually been active on the internet since at least the year 2000, when he began posting his own webcomic, the aforementioned Sonichu. As the name suggests, Sonichu is a strange mix of Sonic the Hedgehog and the Pokemon, Pikachu, which he had originally created for a high school project. The comic was drawn entirely in crayon and prominently featured Chris himself as the main character, with him being a tall, buff ladies man, essentially everything Chris wanted to be in real life. His presence in the media in general actually goes back even further than that, with him first being featured on television in 1994, when he was 12 years old, in a news story covering him winning a contest in which he won $1,000 worth of Sonic merchandise. 12-year-old Christian Chandler of Charlottesville was the winner in a video game shopping spree. Christian is one of only about 100 winners nationally to receive $1,000 worth of Sega games and equipment. For his parents, it's just another example of how well he's doing. Christian is a high-functioning autistic child. This past fall, on his own initiative, he entered a contest based on a favorite cartoon character. What I had to do was exactly watch Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon and I'd listen to what Sonic says at the end of it and write it down for a whole week and then I had to mail it in and I had to be drawn out of a hat and I just won. He would appear on TV again in 1999 at the age of 17 in a news story covering the Pokemon craze that was sweeping the world at the time. I'll switch, I'll put out my Dragonair, even though it has 60 damage on it. Oh boy. And now it has 3 energy on it. 
slam attack. In February 2007, he uploaded his first video to YouTube on his 25th birthday. Hello ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, and dudes of all teenagers, as well as the uh, gals. My name is Christian Chandler, I am here, and y'all are there. <laughs> this message is for everyone of the present and the future beyond this date, February 24th, 2007. My birthday, my 25th birthday. I am high functioning autistic, and in my 25 years, I have seen and learned so much. You should keep in mind of what your true original gender is. Because uh, it's like you're learning about that girl you want to take on a date, young man. Or uh, likewise, you feel more comfortable to approach that boy uh, just saying hello that you've been checking out from a distance, young lady. And hopefully in due time or now, each and every one of you will stay straight. You know, girl for boy, boy for girl. Everything else is vice as said by Dr. Kinsey. Not just for me, not for the big man upstairs, not for your family, but do it for uh, yourself and for, and for the benefits of everyone in the future. Your children, your children's children. And besides, if you stray away from the straight path, it can really jeopardize the entire future of the world and the human race. From this point, Chris would begin revealing all sorts of details about his life and his past. Most infamously, his time in college, where he attempted to gain a girlfriend by putting posters around the campus that stated he was looking for a girl who was at least 18 years old, thin, and white. As Chris was quite open about the fact that he would not consider dating a black woman, Chris has apparently always been somewhat racist towards African Americans, but that's not important. Chris's willingness to share so many details about his life as well as him being incredibly gullible, quick to anger, and just his general weirdness, made him, without question, the most trolled person in history. Since his discovery in 2007 to the present day, trolls have been finding new ways to harass Chris. While some are ultimately harmless, others went too far, such as Clyde Cash and Blue Spike, who convinced Chris that he was in a relationship with a woman named Julie, who was actually the 13-year-old Blue Spike, which of course led to the infamous sex tape that Chris made called For Julie's Eyes Only, which was sent to Chris's parents by the trolls. Even Clyde and Blue Spike's fellow trolls called them out for what they did next, however. When Blue Spike revealed to Chris that he was in fact Julie, and that he had been interacting with a 13-year-old boy, he then forced Chris to use his Sonitude medallion as a suppository while he taunted him. This event will have left a lasting impact on Chris. As the years went by, and new trolls continued to harass him, he began thinking almost everyone he met was a troll, which only made him shut himself away from the outside world even more than he already did. This took a huge toll on his mental health, that only got worse as time went on, as the various videos he uploaded to his channel showed, as he seemed to become increasingly unhinged. One thing I can't avoid talking about when it comes to Chris is their transition. In 2012, Chris began identifying as a woman and changed their name to Christine. And for the rest of this, I'll be referring to them as they, since up until now, everything I've talked about happened when Chris was male. But Chris's transition is not a genuine one. Chris has outright stated that the only reason they wanted to become a woman is so that they might have a chance of dating lesbians, since they've seemingly given up on trying to attract straight women. Not to mention that in order to speed up their transition, they attempted to mutilate their own genitals and shared an image of the results online. And I absolutely do not recommend looking this image up. Chris still identifies as a woman to this day, but needless to say, they don't receive much support from the trans community. Not just because most of them know that Chris is attempting to transition for all the wrong reasons, but also for what they did in 2021, which we'll get to. Before we get into why Chris is such a terrible person, I should know that they have a long history of run-ins with the law. From as early as 2005, Chris has repeatedly found himself in court for various reasons. The most extreme came in 2011, when Chris and his mother Barbara were charged with a hit and run after Chris reversed into Michael Schneider, the manager of the game place. Chris managed to avoid jail time, as Michael Schneider said he didn't want Chris to have a felony on their record and instead insisted that they pay the bills for his medical treatment. The second time Chris found themselves in serious trouble was after an altercation that took place at a GameStop in December 2014, when Chris, angered by the redesign of Sonic the Hedgehog in which his arms were changed to blue, was going around trying to recolor his arms on the cover of the newest game at the time, Sonic Boom. Chris was asked to leave as a result, 
leading them to use pepper spray on one of the employees trying to escort them out. Don't call anybody. Chris was arrested for this and briefly spent time in jail as a result. After a series of court hearings over the preceding 10 months, Chris was eventually ordered to pay a $500 fine after being found guilty of assault. This, of course, would not be Chris's final run-in with the law, but in 2021, they committed a crime that no one could have foreseen, as nobody will have thought that Chris was capable of doing something so horrifying and disgusting. For their entire life, Chris lived with their parents, Bob and Barbara Chandler, until the former's death in 2011. Following this, Chris would use their mother to beg for donations in their videos, as they obviously felt that people would be more willing to help an elderly woman. We are in need of donations for food. Please consider us Thank you. Many people have noted that over the years, Barbara had begun to show signs of dementia, as she often seemed lost and confused in Chris's videos, clearly not being all there mentally. Chris would take advantage of this in the worst way possible. In August 2021, Chris was arrested after it had been reported that they had committed an obscene act with their own mother, with the affair between the two having begun in June of that year. It would seem Chris had been planning this for several months, as they had told Kiwi Farms owner Null that they had purchased several items from Adam and Eve to perform the acts. Chris had shown signs that they were in favour of inter-family relations as far back as 2016, when they commented on a case that involved another mother and son, saying that they shouldn't be sent to jail for what they had done. Chris has shown no remorse for what they have done. If their mother consented to the act, Chris faces up to 10 years in prison. If she did not, they face a considerably longer sentence. This action from Chris marked the end of them just being a lol cow, and instead established them as a truly sick and twisted individual who took advantage of their elderly, dementia-ridden mother. At this point, it's fair to say that Chris is truly beyond redemption. Stanislav Reshetnik, better known by his online handle Stars Reflay, was a Russian streamer who operated on Twitch and YouTube, where he would record himself gaming and playing in online casinos. He was also what is known as a trash streamer, someone who would perform various acts depending on how much someone paid him. He lived with his girlfriend, Valentina Grigorivya, who would often appear in his streams with him. The two did not have a good relationship, as Reflay would often abuse her on camera when paid to do so by his viewers. The abuse regularly involved physical violence. This wasn't helped by the fact that he would frequently get drunk on his streams, making him more likely to agree to such violent requests from his viewers. For whatever reason, Valentina continued living with him, despite the fact that Reflay was clearly a very dangerous and unstable man, as she was not his only victim, with several of his friends also enduring his abuse live on stream. Reflay would continue abusing his girlfriend and the rest of his other friends until December 22nd, 2020, when he finally went too far and performed a truly unforgivable act. During a live stream, a viewer paid Reflay $1,000 to hit Valentina. He did so several times before forcing her onto the balcony outside their apartment. Keep in mind, this was in the extreme cold of a Russian winter and Valentina was dressed only in her underwear. He claimed he locked her outside because she had, quote, an intestinal problem and would have made the apartment stink had she stayed indoors. She frantically banged on the door to be let back in, to which he ignored her. After 15 minutes, the banging outside had stopped, and Reflay went outside. He came back into the view of the camera carrying Valentina, who had stopped breathing and had no heartbeat. After saying that she, quote, looked like she was dead, and attempting to revive her, the paramedics were called. When they arrived, Valentina was pronounced dead at the scene, all while the live stream was still going. The cause of her death was originally ruled as hypothermia, but after an autopsy revealed that Valentina had suffered several blunt force blows to the head, her death was determined to have been caused by cranial cerebral trauma, and as Reflay had beaten Valentina on camera, the authorities immediately knew that he was the one who killed her, and he was arrested and charged with her murder. 
facing up to 15 years in prison. While awaiting trial, Rufle changed his tone on what he had done several times, at first showing remorse and saying that he didn't mean it, and then saying that she was on drugs and would have died anyway regardless of whether he killed her or not. In April of 2021, Rufle was sentenced to six years in prison for intentional infliction of grievous bodily harm resulting in death. While the person who paid Rifle to beat Valentina could be considered the real monster in all of this, as well as the rest of his fans for enabling his violent behaviour in the first place, the fact that he freely agreed to kill his girlfriend out of his own greed shows that he's truly a despicable human being, and, as a murderer, definitely belongs in a video like this. Jared Lee Lofner's time on YouTube was fairly short, but nonetheless significant as he used the site to upload videos that would foreshadow what kind of person he was. A native of Tucson, Arizona, Jared dropped out of high school in his senior year in 2006, at which point those who knew him noticed a change in his behavior, whereby he became incredibly distant and spent a lot of time on his own. He also began taking illegal substances, which obviously made his behavior much more volatile and unpredictable, to the point that his parents disabled his car to stop him from driving, in fears that he'd hurt himself or other people. He did actually attend college during this time, studying at Pima Community College, but he would frequently find himself in trouble with the campus police, having to deal with numerous complaints concerning his behaviour in classrooms and the library. It was during his time at college that he would film his first YouTube video in September 2010, which was shot from his perspective as he wandered around the campus criticizing it, saying that the college itself was illegal according to the United States Constitution, and called it the biggest scam in America. Alright, so here's what we're doing. We're examining the torture of students. We are looking at students who have been tortured. Their low income pay in two wars. The war that we are in right now is currently illegal under the Constitution. What makes it illegal is the currency. The date is also wrong. It's impossible for me that date. It's mind control. How's it going? Good. Thanks for the B. I'm, I'm pissed off. What's that? <laughs> I lost my freedom of speech to that guy. And this is, this is what happens. And I'm in a terrible place. This is the school that I go to. This is my genocide school. <laughs> Where I'm gonna be homeless because of the school. This is Pima Community College. One of the biggest scams in America. Here's the best part, the bookstore. The bookstore, the bookstore, the bookstore. It is so illegal to sell this book under the Constitution. We are also censored by our freedom of speech. If the student is unable to locate the external universe, then the student is unable to locate the internal universe. Where is all my subjects? I could say something sound right now, but I don't feel like it. All the teachers that you have are being paid illegally. and have a legal authority over the Constitution of the United States under the First Amendment. This is genocide in America. Thank you. This is Jared from Pima College. The college saw the video and had it taken down and suspended Jared. They told him he could return if he agreed to a psychological evaluation. He refused and instead dropped out. Those who knew him at college were glad to see him go, as they were afraid he was going to commit a school shooting if he stayed there. After leaving college, he began uploading more to his YouTube channels, Class It Up 10 and Star Hitchnaz. His videos on Class It Up 10 were all text-based, rambling about the government and also criticizing the college. Only one video exists on Star Hitchnaz, and it shows Jared in the woods, wearing a garbage bag around his waist and a pig mask on his head, burning the American flag. This was apparently his way of showing his hatred for the American government. On December 15th, 2010, he uploaded his last video to Class Up 10 entitled, Hello, in which he hints that he is planning something that will happen a few days later. And in January 2011, we would find out what he was planning. 
On January 8, 2011, at 7.04am, Jared went to a Walmart store near the Foothills Mall to purchase ammunition. He was stopped by the Arizona police at 7.34am for running a red light, but once the officer determined that there was no outstanding warrants for Jared, he was allowed to proceed to his destination with a warning to drive carefully. Jared took a taxi to a Safeway supermarket location in Casas Adobes, where Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords was holding a constituents meeting. Jared opened fire on Giffords from close range, hitting her as well as numerous bystanders and killing six people, the youngest of which was only nine years old. Thirteen other people were injured by the gunfire, and one person was injured while fleeing the scene of the shooting. Giffords, the target of the attack, was shot in the head and critically injured, but survived and eventually recovered. Jared was arrested at the scene for the attempted murder of a member of Congress and the murder of six people. Jared was given seven life sentences in prison, as well as 140 years without the possibility of parole. Jared showed no remorse for his crimes, and the mugshot taken after his arrest showed just how happy and proud of himself he was for what he had done. The image of Jared smiling as he stares right into the camera is probably the most chilling picture of any YouTuber in history, as Jared makes no effort to hide just how sick, deranged, and truly evil he is. He will never walk free again, but his actions will forever leave a dark stain on Tucson, Arizona, and the videos showing his descent into madness are still on YouTube to this day. In YouTube's 17-year history, there have been quite a few well-known cases of YouTubers becoming killers. Pekka Eric Alvinen was probably the very first. Pekka Eric Alvinen was a YouTuber based out of Toulouse, Finland, just north of Helsinki. While he had a normal childhood and never displayed any behavior that would be cause for alarm, this all changed when he was attending high school. Reports stated that Pekka began displaying the views of a radical militant and was threatening other students saying they would die in a white revolution, and was also known to be a Nazi enthusiast. His parents attempted to get some help for him from a psychiatrist, but the psychiatrist simply gave Pekka some medication as there was apparently a long waiting list and he wasn't a priority for them. Pekka rarely took the medication given to him for his depression and anxiety, which only made his conditions worse. Unsurprisingly, this caused him to isolate himself from the outside world more and more, and he would spend more of his time on the internet watching violent videos, which he would re-upload to his own YouTube account, as this was back in the days when YouTube didn't really have any real restrictions on what you could upload. His YouTube channel was called Natural Selector 89 Hello everyone, this is me, Natural Selector 89 talking to you, friends and haters and everyone else. I got this idea of making an introduction video to my channel. I guess I have not much to say right now, but... I will make um, more talking videos in the future, and until then, I will continue making my usual videos, which I hope you have enjoyed as well. This is all for now, but I'll see you later and out. And besides uploading the aforementioned violent videos, he would also praise the actions of the perpetrators of said violent videos such as the Columbine shooters and Aum Shinrikyo's sarin gas attack in Tokyo. Alongside those, he also made videos criticizing religions and trying to disprove their existence. In some of these videos, he said that he was a god and should be worshipped. Natural Selector 89 was suspended on October 19, 2007, so he created another channel on the same day called Stormgeist 89. This channel would be very similar to his old channel, as he would talk about massacres and religion. However, he would also create videos showcasing his guns after getting a gun license in October. His channel description also showed how deranged he had become by then. I am prepared to fight and die for my cause. I, as a natural selector, will eliminate all who I see unfit, disgraces of the human race, and failures of natural selection. This was not Pekka trying to be edgy. These truly were his intentions. He purchased over 500 rounds of ammunition and intended to put them to use on November 7th, 2007. That day, Pekka uploaded one final video to his channel. It showed a picture of his school before fading to a red image of him pointing a gun at the camera. At around 11.40 a.m. that day, Pekka arrived at Jokela High School, drew his pistol, and began firing. Seeing himself as the physical embodiment of natural selection, 
he would fire on those who he deemed unworthy to live. In the space of only four minutes, he killed four of his fellow students, as well as a school nurse. Those who crossed his path but were spared were obviously those who he considered to be worthy. Pekka actually called for his fellow students to join him in what he called his revolution. He didn't kill those who refused, instead firing into their classrooms and destroying the televisions inside. After making his way to the school's second floor, he shot one more student, as well as the school's principal. Eventually, the police arrived. Pekka fired several shots at them before fleeing to a bathroom and turning his gun on himself. The attack lasted just half an hour and left eight people dead. Before the attack had happened, the amazing atheist had warned that something like this would happen after he had previously spotlighted Pekka's YouTube channel in one of his videos. Now I warned you guys that um, these social Darwinist kids who idolized uh, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold were dangerous and I got the videos right fucking there to prove it. I warned you. I warned you. I, I went specifically head to head with this very kid who committed this act. I made videos directed exactly at him. And we shouldn't turn him into a monster, and we shouldn't turn him into a hero. We need to think of him as exactly what he was, a pathetic fucking teenager who didn't know um, that, that what he was doing was wrong. Who had no fucking idea about right or wrong at the time. Who was just too fucked up to understand the consequences of his actions in any real way. Unfortunately, it seems that even if people had heeded the amazing atheist's warnings, Pekka would most likely have not been stopped, as the majority of his audience has always been in the US, and those viewers would not have been able to report Pekka to the Finnish authorities. As I said at the beginning of this segment, Pekka was most likely the very first YouTube killer. He may not be as well known as someone like Mr. Anime or Elliot Rogers, but on that day in November 2007, he showed just how cruel and evil a YouTuber can be. And that's the end of the video folks. This one was really hard to make because the UK got hit by two heat waves in the last month, which made editing very difficult since I'm using a Razor Blade 15 laptop, and those things give off insane amounts of heat sometimes, so working on the video during the day just wasn't an option since it turned my bedroom into a sauna. But I finally managed to get it done and I hope that you, at the very least, found it interesting. I'm just going to let you know now that the next video will be another evil musicians list as decided by the poll I did at the start of the year. Thank you very much for watching, be sure to like, comment and subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.